All right, in this video, we're going to talk about classifying economic systems. First off, let's review economics as a discipline. Economics is the study of how individuals maximize their utility in various contexts, households, firms, government, by allocating scarce resources, land, labor, capital, among competing ends. So you know by now that economics is all about we want more than we can ever produce with the resources we have. So we have to make choices and all the choices that we make bring about an opportunity cost. That is, we give something up. So the opportunity cost is the next best alternative foregone. And this is important because every decision we make comes with this opportunity cost. So really, we're living our lives evaluating whether the decision we make is worth the cost. If I go to school as a student, um, I'm giving up working. Is going to school worth the opportunity cost of working? If I go to work, then I give up education. So is going to work worth the opportunity cost of giving up education? These are the decisions that we make all the time. And if you think about them, you realize that we are acting in a certain consistent way. That is, we call people homo economicus, somewhat of an anthropological um, term. But what it implies is that in making the economic decisions every day, we act in a rational manner, meaning we try to better improve our situation, not worsen it. We act in a self-interested manner, meaning that we use our own assessment of what's best for us in making decisions, and we operate in an insatiable manner. No matter how much we have at a given time, we always want more. Okay? So opportunity costs and homo economicus are fundamental to understanding human behavior in the context of the economic problem of scarcity. Once we understand what economics is, we then can move on to economic institutions. These are the formal and informal ways people organize their economic, political, and social activities. Note that these economic institutions expand beyond just the realm of economics. They include things like political and social activities. These represent the rules of the game. So a way to think about this is human beings are dealing every day with the economic problem of scarcity, right? But we deal with that problem through certain rules or with certain rules. Okay? For example, if you decide that you want to go uh, shopping okay, today, you want to go to the store and buy some groceries, you say, well, I would like to use my time to buy groceries. Uh, I'm willing to give up the opportunity cost, right? Buying groceries means you know, not s staying at home or, or not going to school, or you're giving something up to buy the groceries, right? So you're willing to do that. And um, you are rational, self-interested, and insatiable. So that's the kind of best option for you. But when you go to the store, there are certain rules. For example, on the way to the store, you're not allowed to go over 65 miles per hour on the freeway. That's a human devised constraint that shapes interaction. It's a rule. It's actually a political rule because the government is forcing you formally to not drive more than 65 miles an hour. Okay? And then you get to the store and you have your money and you go and you shop and you pay the cash uh, cashier. Well, the rules of the game there are economic. You have to, in order to leave the store with that stuff, you have to pay for it. Right? So there's certain rules there. Now, what if in the process of shopping, you put something in your bag and you don't pay for it? Well, you've violated one of the rules. A political rule says you have to pay for the product. And there is remedy by the government for the store if you don't, right? They'll call the police. So that's a rule that shapes your behavior. So you can drive to the store as long as you keep it under 65 miles an hour. You can go to the store and, and leave with the stuff as long as you pay the cashier for it. Um, things like that. 
So we operate with these rules. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean we follow the rules, but the rules are there and they do shape how we interact and how we behave. Okay? The enforcement mechanisms. Institutions have to be enforced in order to have any kind of bite because otherwise people won't have uh, as much of an incentive to follow them. And here's some examples of enforcement mechanisms. Uh, conventions, ethics, customs, culture in essence uh, represent uh, means of enforcement. For example, if you're walking out of the grocery store and um, somebody's right behind you, let's say you open the door, you walk out, but then you let the door shut in their face. You don't hold it open for them. Well, that would be a violation of a social uh, rule, a social kind of institution that says you should hold the door open. So what's the punishment? Well, social stigma. They give you a dirty look or say thank you sarcastically or something like that. You don't go to jail, right? But you definitely end up having some um, loss to the extent you value being a part of society and being respected. So culture guides a lot of uh, behavior. It allows for the rules to actually have bite behind them. Um, private rules or involve organized private enforcement. So some private organizations will set up their own rules. If you, for example, are a doctor and you join the American Medical Association, well, that's a private organization that says that you agree to abide by their rules, okay, that are above and beyond what would be the rules for a doctor that is not part of the American Medical Association. But you don't have to join. Right. So it's voluntary. But if you choose to join, then you agree to follow their their rules. Uh, public rules are government. OK, so it's kind of the same thing as private rules. But now the government becomes the enforcer and speed limits, uh, shoplifting laws, murder laws, you know, all these things that limit what you can do uh, are rules. Um, that are enforced by the government. And then anarchy. Anarchy is the absence of rules. So in the absence of rules, uh, you may get a certain level of chaos, but you won't get complete chaos because even if there is the absence of, let's say, political rules, so let's say there's no government, so we have anarchy in government, so there's no speed limits, there's no shoplifting laws, there's no murder laws. Well, you're going to have problems, but you're still going to have, you know, culture. And that's going to guide some behavior, right? Some people aren't going to shop list, some people aren't going to speed, and some people aren't going to murder other people simply because they have a self-commitment and they don't want the social stigma that comes with those behaviors, even if the government isn't there to force them to uh, abide by those rules. Okay, so think about what we're doing here. We're kind of expanding upon our understanding of basic economics because we're saying human beings are faced with the economic problem of scarcity and we create these institutions that provide rules and those rules are enforced in a variety of ways, most likely to better our society, right? Now, of course, a lot of these um, institutions are going to be debatable, but generally speaking, they emerge as a means of helping us, right, as a society, helping us get along uh, as opposed to harming us. An economic system is a distinct cluster of institutions for decision making within a geographical area. It's multidimensional, meaning that the economic system is equal to a function of all those institutions that make it up, okay? Um, and there, you know, there's going to be hundreds of institutions within a particular country. Um, and one way to analyze this is with these two-dimensional graphs down here. Let's say each uh, axis here represents a particular institution. So I1 and I2. Okay? We could even create institutions hypothetically. Let's say I1 is the level of democracy in a country. So the, the political institution. Um, so more democracy moving up, less democracy moving down. 
Okay, and let's say on the horizontal axis we have the level of taxation. Okay, so higher taxes versus lower taxes. Another political institution because the government is the taxing authority. Now each of these countries here represents a particular combination. So for example, this country has a very high level of taxation, but a only moderate level of democracy. Whereas this country here has a high level of democracy and a low level of taxation. So on and so forth. Now, in this instance, there's really no obvious collection of countries that um, we can call e an economic system. But if instead of these dots here representing countries, let's say the X's and the Y's represent different countries. Well, now you see distinctive clusters. See how the X's seem to co go together? They have a high level of democracy and a lower level of taxation. And the Y's seem to go together. These are countries that have a higher level of taxation and a lower level of democracy. You know, maybe these countries here are like North Korea or Cuba or Venezuela. And these countries here are like France, the Canada, the UK, the US. Well, now we have distinctive systems. And what we're doing here in this class in particular is we're trying to identify these economic systems, which are just composites of institutions that seem to give them distinction. Okay, So we would, in this class, delineate between Cuba and America. And that's in part because the institutions of Cuba are very different socially, politically, economically. The rules of the game are different than in the U.S. Okay? So that's one way to think about it. Now let's go back and redefine economics. Well, economics is the study of how individuals maximize their utility in various contexts, households, firms, government, by allocating scarce resources among competing ends. That was all the same, right? That was from, from before. Okay? But now we add subject to the prevailing economic system. So economics is essentially we deal with scarcity, but we do so with these rules of the game. And those rules are very different in some countries than in other countries as defined by their economic system. There are many institutions, as I said, there's hundreds. However, we can focus initially on four big ones. And the four big institutions are property rights, that is who owns the resources, decision-making, that is who allocates the resources, the incentive system, that is what motivates production, and the public choice system how is the government determined, okay? So the four big institutions that help us really kind of color the world as uh, distinctive, North Korea versus the US, that kind of thing. That color is provided by these differences in institutions. Let's go through each of these. Let's start with property rights. So property rights involve ownership, right? The whole idea of having rights over property is that you own the property. It's an amalgam of rights that individuals have over objects. To have full property rights, full ownership rights, you have the right to dispose, which means you can sell the item to someone else. You have the right to utilize, which means you can use it for your own benefit. And you have the right to generate income, meaning you can lease it out, rent it out, and charge people for its use. Full ownership rights do not always occur. Uh, for example, if you own your home in the US, then you can sell the home, you can use it, or you can lease it out. So you have full ownership rights. However, if you are a renter in the US, you usually cannot sell the home you rent. You cannot generate income from it. You know, that would be a sublease, and most residential rentals do not allow subleasing. Um, but you can utilize it. So you have partial ownership rights. You have the right to use that property for a period of time as a renter, but you don't have the same expansive rights that the owner the, uh, of that property has. Okay? Forms of property ownership at the broadest level, private ownership, which we call capitalism, where individuals can hold full ownership rights, or public, collective ownership what we call socialism, where the state or members of the collective have property rights. So capitalism versus socialism is really one of who can own property in a particular area. And that's going to determine who uh, or how that property is used. Under capitalism, individual property owners are the ones that determine how to use the property. 
and that is how they want to maximize their return on that property. Do they want to rent it out or do they want to live in it? Individuals would decide. Whereas in socialism, the government would decide. If we have government housing, for example, the government would decide you know, if it's going to be rented out, who's going to use it, that kind of thing. Okay, we'll pick up in the next video from there. Thanks.